we are going to talk about uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. Now, in the emergency department, we see diabetic ketoacidosis uh, quite often. And so the main focus here will be to uh, uh, talk about uh, DKA. Um, there are various aspects that we will um, try to touch base. So obviously, the first thing we'll look at is uh, what is diabetic ketoacidosis and um, how to diagnose uh, a diabetic ketoacidosis on the basis of clinical background, clinical assessment, and various types of uh, investigations. Of course, uh, there are some triggers which might uh, lead to diabetic ketoacidosis in a patient with DK. We'll try to identify those. In the emergency department, the best part is we just don't, not only diagnose it, we try to do something. And so we will try to manage that uh, DK uh, on uh, the basis of uh, various guidelines. Uh, the DK itself can cause various types of complications. And um, the treatment of DK can also cause complications. And we'll try to identify those and we'll try to add those, address those issues as well. Now, before I get into the discussion about diabetic ketoacidosis or DK, let's uh, talk about a patient that I have seen uh, recently. So I was working in a rural emergency department and um, uh, in that uh, particular setting, there was no anesthetic uh, department and uh, there was no ICU either. The nearest intensive care unit was 30 minutes uh, away by helicopter. So we got a call from the paramedics that a 73-year-old female collapsed on the floor and her GCS was 4 at this moment. They could um, uh, check the blood sugar and they found that it was high and there was no specific number that they could pick up. The temperature was low and the patient will be here with us within 5 minutes. Now, on arrival, we found that this is a very critically unwell patient who uh, had a low GCS. There was an oropharyngeal tube. Um, she was found to be hypertensive and heart rate was normal. She was found to be cold, clammy, and um, the blood sugar was high. Now, at that moment, the initial numbers were um, quite concerning, but within a few minutes, her numbers changed even further. So our main concern at that moment was to stabilize her and to transfer her to the nearest intensive care unit. Um, so there was no failure to oxygenate at that moment, no failure to ventilate. However, there was impending airway compromise. So we uh, were preparing for intubation, but also we are preparing to optimize her before we intubate. So we got some little background story of this lady that she had uh, type 2 diabetes. She was bipolar and she was taking lithium. We were not sure how much compliant she was. She also has a background history of chronic kidney disease. And the daughter saw her just a day before and was found to be pretty normal. We got some blood gas result at that moment. And we found uh, that uh, in the venous gas, the pH was 6.8. So there was severe um, life-threatening acidemia. The partial pressure carbon dioxide was 28 and bicarbonate was 4.5, which shows that it was a metabolic acidosis with some respiratory uh, compensation. Now, if we do the Winters formula, then we can find that the expected partial pressure carbon dioxide was 14 or 15. So our observed measured partial pressure carbon dioxide was well above it. So basically, it's a combined metabolic acidosis with concomitant respiratory acidosis. Also, she had uh, the lactic acid was 7.5, so she's got lactic acidosis as well. And if we look at the sodium level, that was a little low, mild hyponatremia. However, if we do the uh, corrected sodium, it, it was high. The potassium was moderately high, 7.3, and our focus was not only to manage the patient, but also to keep an eye on the potassium level. This patient has got initial glucose was, uh, it was showing more than 38, but we got the actual blood sugar level within a few minutes and it was 83. The ketone was 7.3, so this is the acetic acid level, because in that particular lab, they could not check the beta-hydroxybutyric acid level on that very moment. 
the urea creatine in both of them are high but if we consider the urea creatine ratio then uh, the, it was more than 100 so that indicates that there is some prerenal component but we know that this patient has got chronic kidney disease so it's a it's a probably an acute on chronic um, probably secondary to dehydration the measured um, serum osmolality was 356 which was quite high at that moment so from the from this analysis of the blood gas it's a very complicated critically unwell patient with multiple problems but the main problem was diabetic ketoacidosis a hyper osmolarity and also hyperglycemic and hyperketotic state if we combine them all together it comes up as a diabetic ketoacidosis rather than a hyper uh, osmolar hyperglycemic non ketotic state so that was me it was there was multiple problems here it was a critically unwell patient with limited resources and there were more than one time critical emergencies in front of us so the differential diagnosis on the basis of the clinical assessment and the lab result was that it was a diabetic ketoacidosis but also we were keeping in mind that in an elderly patient hhs may be a possibility but we did not rule it out completely of course there was chronic kidney disease and the uremia can cause hyaluronic metabolic acidosis as well because she was hypothermic elderly patient with diabetes sepsis was in our radar of thinking in the thought process also there was um, uh, the uh, thinking that um, it could be an integral hemorrhage or uh, uh, there may be a CVA or stroke. Lithium overdose, we were thinking about it, uh, maybe a chronic lithium overdose. However, we checked the lithium level later and we found that it was normal. So it was not a lithium overdose. So in this particular patient, there are multiple problems, but we were focusing on one aspect at a time. So let's talk about decay at this moment. So over the next few minutes, we'll talk about a little bit about the background, what is diabetic ketoacidosis, how it happens, what are the triggers, what we can do about it, and what are the various complications. Now, diabetic ketoacidosis is a complication of diabetes, which can be type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Whenever we talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, we need to think about uh, the hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic uh, state as well. Sometimes it can be quite tricky and difficult to differentiate between them. However, there are some guidelines we will, we will talk about in a minute uh, to differentiate between these two um, quite critical conditions. So obviously, the main difference between this is that there is severe ketoacidosis in case of a decay, while in case of HSS, there may be no ketone or little ketone there. So let's focus on how this diabetic ketoacidosis develops. So first of all, patient either has got insulin deficiency, lacking, or there is resistance to insulin. And virtually any part of the body can be affected as a consequence. So in this uh, flowchart, in the center is the uh, carbohydrate metabolism. So if there is not much insulin, the glucose uptake that is heavily compromised. On the left-hand side, as we can see that uh, the uh, uh, fat metabolism that can be affected as well and so the fat breaks down which gives rise to free fatty acid on the right hand side the, uh, we can see that there is increased breakdown of the protein which gives rise to amino acid as a consequence we have got three components here in the center we have got increased glucose on the left hand side we have got increased free fatty acid and on the right hand side we have got increased uh, amino acid both amino acid and the free fatty acid they can undergo gluconeogenesis in the liver which ultimately lead give rise to hyperglycemia so the mainstay of the diabetic ketoacidosis is the hyperglycemia of course there are a few exceptions and we'll talk about it in a, in a minute when there is increase in the blood sugar this glucose will appear in the in the kidney and when the glucose is more than the renal threshold value then all the glucose cannot be reabsorbed. So that glucose will come out in the urine. Because glucose is osmotically active substance, it will take with it a lot of water. And also it will take with it sodium, calcium, potassium, phosphate, chloride. Total body electrolyte deficiency will occur. 
and uh, there will be not only volume depletion but also severe um, renal impairment as all this has happened in our patient. Now please don't forget that the free fatty acid can undergo beta hydroxyl beta uh, oxidation which will give rise to ketones acetone acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acid those can appear in the urine and also you can check it in the serum um, so these uh, ketones or especially the keto acids the acetic acid and beta, beta hydroxybutyric acid they will add up to the acidosis and the renal impairment uh, can also add up to the higher iron gum metabolic acidosis. Now, on the right hand side, please don't forget that uh, the uh, free fatty acid, sorry, the uh, amino acids from the uh, breakdown of the protein that will give rise to gluconeogenesis and increase sugar level, and that can add up to the osmotic diuresis as well. So, this is on the left hand side, we have got a normal kidney. Of a patient. Now, on the right hand side, this is a different patient who is suffering from diabetic ketoacidosis. So, in a normal patient, there is a little urine production after uh, the passage of blood, glomerular filtration, and ultrafiltration and uh, reabsorption process. On the right hand side, as you can see, the urine output is a lot more than a normal patient because of the um, glucose. Glucose is osmotically active substance. And it will take not only water, but also various types of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, and so forth. As a consequence, the total body sodium will be decreased, total body potassium will be decreased, total body calcium will be decreased, and it will be a very complicated electrolyte abnormality. Now, uh, the triggers in case of the diabetic ketoacidosis. So, the commonest cause or co commonest trigger for the diabetic ketoacidosis is that the patient is either not taking adequate amount of insulin or they are not compliant with uh, the medication at all. Uh, in about 20 to 25 percent of the cases, we will find that um, the diabetic ketoacidosis may be the first presentation of this patient. Um, there are some acute illnesses, for example, sepsis or infection which can be pneumonia, urinary tract infection, stroke can trigger diabetic ketoacidosis. Any type of injury, uh, which may be MI, which may be pancreatitis, P, any rotary accident, that can trigger the um, uh, decay as well. There are some drugs specifically to mention lithium. So our patient was on lithium. And also, uh, there is a novel uh, diabetic uh, treatment, uh, something called the sodium glucose uh, uh, anti so sodium glucose uh, co-transporter inhibitor, which can give rise to euglycemic decay. So the decay patient will initially present just like the diabetes patient. So they will have uh, polyuria, they will have uh, polydipsia, they will drink a lot of water because they are dehydrated. They can have uh, weight loss. They can start on hyperventilation because they have got metabolic acidosis. They try to remove the uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, in case of a decay also, some patients can have an abdominal pain. And the, the cause of the abdominal pain is prostaglandin. Increased prostaglandin can give rise to abdominal pain. Many of the patients can have some neurological manifestations like confusion, agitation, and um, some of them can develop even coma. Now, especially the neurological manifestations are more commonly found in case of uh, HHS. When the serum osmolality is more than 320 milliosmol per liter, they can develop the uh, neurological manifestations more. Um, so some, some of the patients can develop like a stroke. And again, that is more commonly found if the serum osmolality is very high. Now, if we consider the diagnostic evaluation, there are three big areas that we need to focus on, three big boxes. The first thing is the cardiovascular status. Now, what is the heart rate? What is the blood pressure? What is the respiratory and saturation? Now, in our patient, uh, initially the blood pressure was fine, heart rate was fine, but within a few minutes, her blood pressure plummeted to about 100, and the heart rate was uh, high as well. She was tachypneic, and the saturation was surprisingly normal. The second uh, big box that we would like to talk about is the volume status. 
as I just mentioned in the animation a couple of slides back, the patient loses a lot of water. And so they are heavily dehydrated. The water, uh, total water deficit may be 6 liters to 10 liters. Same is true in case of HSS. In fact, in case of the HSS, the uh, total, total water deficit is even worse. They can be 10 liter, 12 liter. And the third big, big box, obviously, is the mental status, as we have just mentioned. Uh, they can have, they can be initially normal, GCS, but they can be confused, agitated, and sometimes they can be comatose, and also they can have some neurological manifestations. So clinically, if we want to consider the diagnosis of decay, these are the three big boxes that we would like to consider: uh, cardiorespiratory status, volume status, and the mental status. Now, investigation. There is a whole lot of investigation that can be done in the ED, in the ICU, or in the ward. But the main focus of investigation in the emergency department will be to do the blood gas to see if there is any hyperglycemia. Second thing we would like to look at is the serum ketones to see if there is any ketoacidosis. With regards to the ketone, we need to add on beta-hydroxybutyric acid. Otherwise, it can be missed. The third thing we need like to look at is the blood gas to see if there is any acidosis, what is the anion gap, and um, if there is any compensation or not. Of course, we would like to do some more tests like electrolytes. A special focus will be to look at sodium and potassium. The sodium can be falsely reduced because of hyperglycemia, but potassium, that can be the mainstay of the electrolytes. Potassium normally uh, should the uh, total body potassium is low, but surprisingly, in patient of decay, the potassium can be either normal or elevated. If the potassium is low in a patient of decay, that is a very bad sign because um, uh, once we give the treatment, that uh, potassium will be reduced even further, and that can be life threatening. Some other few tests we can do, like an ECG, to see if there is any. Um, uh, effect of the hyper hypercalcemia hyperkalemia on the ECG. We can do some other tests like chest X-ray, cultures, and lipase to see if there any uh, pancreatitis in that particular patient. American Diabetic Association has got um, uh, a, a diagnostic criteria for decay and HSS. Now the mainstay here is the a few things. Uh, with regards to the glucose, usually in case of HSS, the glucose is really, really high, more than 33.3 millimole per liter. In case of decay, we are more conservative. Usually, in case of a decay, the blood sugar is less than 33.3, but more than 13.9 millimole per liter. Now, uh, in case of pH, the patient of decay, they, they are usually very uh, acidotic. The pH is less than uh, 7.3. But in case of HSS, the pH can be more than 7.3. With regards to the bicarbonate, um, uh, usually in case of HSS, the bicarbonate is high, more than 18 millimole per liter. And in case of a decay, depending whether it is mild, moderate, or severe, it can be variable. In our patient, it was 4.5. Which, is, which falls into the category of severe uh, decay. Ketones, with regards to the ketones, please don't forget that in the nitroprusside test, um, we do not check the beta-hydroxybutyric acid. So we need to specifically look for the beta-hydroxybutyric acid. And that is either it is absent or it is very small in case of HHS. But in case of a decay, it is always high. Uh, in our patient, it was uh, pretty high. Um, with regards to the osmolarity, that is a very good option to consider the differentiation between the HSS and DK. Usually, in case of HSS, it is more than 320 millimoles per kg, but in case of the DK, it is variable. In our patient, it was um, 350 plus. Anion gap can be found in all of them, so that is uh, something uh, we cannot use for differentiating these two categories of conditions. With regards to the mental status and neurology, it is more found in case of HSS abnormality. And in case of severe decay, the, uh, the coma can be found as well. But if it is mild decay, they may not have any neurology at all. Now, 
this is a very critical scenario where the blood sugar level is normal there is no hyperglycemia but still they can have diabetic ketoacidosis these are the four conditions that we need to consider one is if the patient has got poor oral intake not eating and drinking normally number two if the patient comes uh, to the hospital and just before coming to the hospital they have taken insulin the third category is pregnant patient and the fourth category is the uh, patients who are on uh, sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor this is a novel um, a medication for diabetes but itself this medicine can give euglycemic decay whenever we get the decay of, of course we have got a lot of differential diagnosis but uh, because these patients can have reduced level of consciousness we need to consider a metabolic encephalopathy like a hepatic encephalopathy as a differential diagnosis we also need to consider alcoholic ketoacidosis now with regards to the alcoholic ketoacidosis a unique feature is that they do not develop coma their gcs is usually 14 or 15 so that is a difference between the alcoholic ketoacidosis and diabetic ketoacidosis there are lots of different conditions of high energy metabolic acidosis uh, like uh, cat mud piles that is a mnemonic that we use um, all of them can come into the differential diagnosis of uh, decay now with regards to the management obviously the main focus the first initial management is the fluid resuscitation so we need to give normal saline to start with and then we can convert it to half normal saline or dextrose or just normal saline we can continue as a maintenance uh, fluid the second big box that we would like to talk about is the uh, ele electrolyte correction and the main electrolyte that we are concerned about is potassium and I will show you some images or some animations in a minute. The third big box is the insulin infusion. The, the, in case of a decay we give uh, 0.1 unit per kg per hour and in case of HSS we give low dose of insulin that is 0.05 unit per kg per hour so uh, in the emergency department uh, we try to do mainly the uh, fluid resuscitation and correction of electrolytes but insulin can be done later do not give insulin before we check the potassium and correct the potassium appropriately now with regards to the fluid resuscitation the first fluid that we give is normal saline if the patient is in a state of shock we need to give uh, several liters of fluid and sometimes we might have to add on some inotropic support like noradrenaline 0 0.05 to 1 microgram per kg per minute to aim for a map of 65 millimeter of mercury. However, if the patient is in, not in a state of shock, then we can just give maybe 20 ml per kg of normal saline. So that will prevent any further deterioration of this patient. Once we have restored the fluid volume, then we can give either normal saline if the um, patient has got um, 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 reduced uh, sodium level. If the corrected sodium is reduced less than 135 millimole per liter, we can give 0.9% sodium per hour. However, if the corrected sodium is normal or elevated, we can give half normal saline at a rate of um, 14 ml or 10 ml per kg per hour. Now, of course, we need to keep an eye on the blood sugar level. And if the blood sugar is less than 11.1 uh, millimole per liter, we need to add on some dextrose, maybe 5% or 10% dextrose. Now, electrolyte correction, that is really, really important topic, um, especially with potassium. Now, there are three big scenarios here. If the potassium is less than 3.3 uh, millimole per liter, then we need to add potassium at first, 20 to 40 millimole per hour IV and then we need to give insulin do not give insulin in a patient who has got potassium of less than 3.3 millimole per liter the patient can develop severe dysarrhythmia and can even die so we need to keep an eye on the potassium now the second scenario that can happen is if the potassium is between 3.3 uh, and 5.3 now this is a this is a scenario where we st still need to give some potassium and we can at the same time give some insulin as well in third scenario we switch to our patient in my patient the potassium was 7.3 so any potassium more than 5.3 we don't have to add on potassium but we can give insulin 
Now let's talk about the potassium because this is uh, some uh, important topic and we need to have a very good understanding about it. Now on the left hand side this is a cell and intracellular potassium is usually high. So usually it is 150 millimole per liter. Extracellular environment it has got less potassium. Usually it is 4 millimole per liter with a classic normal pH of 7.4. In the cell membrane there are a lot of different exchange transporter and proteins. One of them is the hydrogen potassium antipode. Its job is to transfer hydrogen and potassium in the opposite direction. So when hydrogen comes out, potassium goes in. When hydrogen goes in, potassium comes out. And this is a secondary active transport process. Similar type of carrier transport uh, proteins are there. Uh, for example, the sodium potassium ATPase system, which can be influenced by insulin. And in diabetes, we need to consider that. Now, in my patient, this is the scenario. So here, in the extracellular environment, there is a lot of hydrogen. Um, so the pH is 6.8, and the potassium here is 7.3. Now, why there is so many potassium? This is because as there is a lot of hydrogen here, some of the hydrogen ion will enter the cell, and in exchange, potassium will come out of the cell. And that is why the extracellular potassium is so high. Now, uh, what happens if we give treatment to this patient? So in my patient, for example, if we have given fluid, we have given insulin, we have given antibiotics for sepsis, as we give the treatment, this hydrogen ion in the extracellular environment, they will disappear, just as, as you can see that the hydrogen ion, they are disappearing. As the hydrogen ion disappears, there is a gradient formation between intracellular and extracellular hydrogen. So the body will try to transfer the hydrogen out of the cell. And as the hydrogen ion comes out, equal number of potassium ion will enter. Similarly, another hydrogen ion comes out and another potassium ion enters. Another hydrogen ion comes out and potassium ion enters and it goes on and on and on. And that is why the extracellular potassium that decreases. Now, this extracellular potassium will not decrease if we do not give treatment to this patient. So as we give treatment with fluid, with insulin, with uh, antibiotics, uh, this thing uh, will go on. So as you, as you have seen, the pH of that patient, which was 6.8, has increased to 7.0. And so the pH has increased mm -hmm. 1, uh, uh, sorry, 0.2. And so the potassium has decreased from 7.3 to 6.3. So 1 millimole per liter. So the formula here is for every 0.2 pH increase, the potassium decreases 1 millimole per liter. So at the end of it, when we have given treatment several hours later, several maybe several days later, when we get the potassium of um, 7.4, that is the ideal pH, the potassium will decrease to 4.3. So this is called corrected potassium. So corrected potassium is a potassium when the pH is 7.4. So let's uh, repeat the um, formula here. So the corrected potassium or predicted potassium is measured potassium. In my case, it was 7.3 minus 7.4 minus the pH, which was 6.8 divided by 0.2. So essentially for every 0.2 pH increase, the potassium decreases by um, one millimole per liter. There is another formula that we need to consider in case of corrected sodium. The corrected sodium is measured sodium plus glucose minus 5 divided by 3. So in our patient, the measured uh, sodium was uh, 128 and the glucose was uh, 83. So 83 minus uh, 5, so that will be, um, uh, I'm terrible in math, sorry. Okay, so the insulin infusion. So the third big box in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis is insulin. So as we have mentioned earlier, that do not give insulin in a patient who has got potassium of less than 3.3 because that can kill the patient. So in these cases, at first, we need to give 20 or up to 30 or even 40 millimole of potassium to right, and then we need to give insulin. In second big category is if the patient has got um, potassium of um, more than 3.3 millimole per liter, we can give some insulin. Usually the dose of insulin is uh, 0.1 unit per kg per hour. 
Um, now, there are some controversies with regards to the management and with regards to the decay itself. The first uh, 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 controversy or confusion is, should we do ABG or should we consider VBG? Now, there are quite a few papers on it. One of the paper that was published by John Ma, uh, they showed that um, whether we do the ABG or VBG, it actually does not make any mass difference to the clinicians in the decision-making process. So VBG is as good as ABG if we consider the decision-making process by the emergency clinicians. Now, uh, another paper was uh, uh, written by Anne-Marie Kelly in the Emergency Medicine Australasia, and uh, her paper showed that um, there is a very well uh, correlation between the uh, bicarbonate and the pH between the arterial gas and the venous gas. However, there is very poor um, type of uh, correlation if we consider partial pressure carbon dioxide or base excess. So the bottom line is that in case of diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a metabolic condition, we are happy to look at the pH and bicarbonate. So we don't have to do the ABG, the VBG is good enough. Uh, similar uh, paper was uh, written by same author in uh, another journal. In that case, the only difference was that I think it was a uh, few more papers were considered or included in this um, uh, review. And the conclusion was the same, that um, uh, for the patient who is not in a state of shock, there is no difference between the arterial gas and the venous gas if we consider only pH and bicarbonate. However, if we consider partial pressure carbon dioxide or partial pressure oxygen, then we need to do an ABG. So that is the uh, conclusion. Now, the second uh, controversy is that after the IV fluid, should we start insulin straight away? As we have mentioned several times, that if we give insulin without knowing the potassium, and if the potassium is below 3.3, that patient can die. So ideally, we should not rush to give, giving uh, insulin, right? Um, the third um, controversy that, that is, if the pH is below 7.1, should we give sodium bicarbonate? Now, the, the, uh, there are a lot of different uh, expertise uh, of different clinicians. However, there is a systematic uh, review which was published by um, Chua and the co-authors um, in the um, Annals of Intensive Care in 2011. And it showed, um, honestly speaking, uh, there is no justification of adding uh, sodium bicarbonate. Adding the sodium bicarbonate itself can cause a lot of problems. It can cause uh, fluid overload. It can cause hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. It can cause uh, metabolic alkalosis. Um, so adding sodium bicarbonate is not going to help the patient. However, in case of life-threatening acidosis, like in our patient with a pH of below 6.9, uh, most authors suggest that let's uh, start some sodium bicarbonate. Uh, there was another paper by uh, Duhon, and they concluded the same thing, that uh, there is no justification of giving sodium bicarbonate if the pH is below 7.1. However, if the pH is very low, like 6.8, then yes, we can give some uh, sodium bicarbonate, but we need to keep an eye that there will be some complication, especially potassium can go down drastically. The third confusion is, should we give bolus insulin or should we give infusion? In earlier days, we used to give bolus insulin at first, and then we used to give infusion. However, especially in pediatric patients, it shows that the initial, initial bolus insulin actually is not going to add anything. It's not going to help. Instead, it can cause harm because the blood sugar will be uncontrollably be reduced. So uh, with regards to the um, insulin, uh, as we have mentioned, the initial insulin dose is not associated with any benefit. Instead, it can cause harm. So the bottom line is that do not give any bolus insulin. We'll just go for insulin infusion. There is some controversy with regards to the uh, anticoagulant use. It was found that diabetes itself can make the patient hypercoagulable. 
even in pediatric patient, they can develop uh, thromboembolism. In the femoral vein, uh, after putting a central line, they can develop uh, deep vein thrombosis. Should we give anticoagulant? The practice is that there is not enough sufficient data to, uh, to uh, say anything for it or refute it. However, the general practice is that we don't give a routine anticoagulant therapy. In elderly patients, like in case of the HHS, who are bedridden, debilitated patients, yes, we can give some anticoagulant. But in young patients who are mobile, it's not justified. What fluid should we give? Is it normal saline or is it half normal saline? There is a little bit of controversy about it. Um, and uh, the bottom line is, initial resuscitative fluid should always be normal saline. It will be 0.9% sodium chloride. The only time we can give half normal saline is in case of the maintenance fluid, provided that the corrected sodium is either, corrected sodium is normal or it is high. So as you have mentioned, that with regards to the fluid management, there are three scenarios that can happen. There, there is one scenario where the patient is in a state of shock. We need to push a lot of fluid in this case. The second scenario where the patient is not in a state of shock, we can give 20 ml per kg of body weight of sodium chloride, 0.9% sodium chloride. If the patient, once this is done, the initial resuscitative fluid, maintenance fluid should be either normal saline or half normal saline, depending on what is the corrected sodium. If the corrected sodium is normal or elevated, half normal saline is good. However, if the corrected sodium is still low, then we need to give uh, normal saline. So let's go back to my patient who um, uh, has been managed so far. So initially we have prepared that we are going to intubate this patient. We have contacted the ICU. We've gone through the ARO checklist and we have uh, given 100% oxygen for pre-oxygenation. Now the most important part before intubation was the pre-treatment to optimize this patient. With regards to the optimization, we have done exactly what the management protocols have said with regards to the decay. So we have given fluid, we have given adrenaline infusion to aim for a map of 65 millimeter mercury. We have given, uh, we, have, we have the potassium was 7.3. So we did not have to um, give any potassium at that moment. Uh, instead, we have started on insulin infusion. Um, uh, we have started on 0.1 unit per kg per hour infusion. Uh, we have given some sodium bicarbonate because the pH was very low. It was a 6.8 and we are anticipating that after intubation, she might crash. We have given some antibiotics because sepsis was in our radar as well as a trigger. We have given um, uh, some uh, uh, fentanyl and we have intubated the patient with video laryngoscope, which was a first pass success. After intubation, we have done a chest X-ray which confirmed that the endotracheal tube was in place. It was also confirmed with endotracheal CO2. We have repeated the blood gas. We have put an IC uh, indwelling catheter, did a chest X-ray, ECG, and transferred the patient with a helicopter. Right later, we retrospectively, when we reviewed the notes, we found that the patient was um, extubated three days later and was discharged home, and she 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 was she is doing well. So. The, in summary, we can see that in this particular case, it was early diagnosis was made and there are multiple issues, including the patient factor, the equipment factor, and the overall uh, resource factor. Similarly, um, uh, we, we made the best effort to optimize her and stabilize her. It was a good team effort. There were multiple problems with this patient, decay, sepsis, kidney injury, and there was some question mark about lithium toxicity. So if we consider diabetic ketoacidosis, always think about fluid, fluid, fluid. Next, think about the electrolyte management, especially uh, special consideration should be given to potassium. The third thing that we'd like to keep an eye on, insulin infusion, but it doesn't get the priority. It should be given only after the potassium is corrected. And last thing, but not the least, is the sick and treat the underlying cause. In case of sepsis, give some antibiotics. If there is kidney injury, some patients might need uh, dialysis. So these are the few 
papers that I have used. The most important paper was, of course, the up-to-date articles in uh, diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS, but also there was some good uh, article in uh, Rebel Young, uh, and there are some original papers from uh, Ma, um, Kelly, uh, and Mary Kelly, uh, Chua, and uh, Goyal. Um, um, so that's about diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, if you have got any further questions, please uh, drop me a line. You can write uh, on the comment section. Um, if, uh, you can uh, contact me at any time um, uh, if you have any further questions. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll um, get in touch very soon. Bye for now.